How many went to Sunday school? Okay, what was your favorite story from Sunday school? I'm sure you all have one, at least, very much, at the very least, one. Mine was one that was referenced in the Old Testament lesson today. In fact, it's the, the story that happens right before the reading that we heard Paul, uh, Keith read to us today. It is the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Elijah shows up at the end of 1 Kings, and he is called by God from his town of Tishbe in Gilead in the northern kingdom of Israel to be a prophet, to speak God's word, the truth, to power. And speaking the truth to power is never easy, but especially for Elijah. Elijah's task as the prophet of God was speak, to speak the truth of God's word to King Ahab and Queen Jezebel. Of all the kings of the northern kingdom of Israel, we get the most information about Ahab because he's one of the worst, most despicable of all the kings of both the southern and the, the northern kingdom. And his wife was worse. Now Ahab was Jewish. He at the very least was raised to fear Yahweh, the God of Israel. His wife, not even close. She was a worshiper of Baal, one of the fertility gods of the Canaanites. In fact, the fertility god of the Canaanites. But he was also the god of the rain, the harvest, and even the dew on the ground. And the first thing that Elijah was tasked as the called prophet of God to these two was to say there's going to be a drought. Not even dew will form on the ground for years, which is a direct slap in the face of their god, Baal. As I said, the story that I remember most from Sunday school was the contest, the showdown between Elijah and the prophets of God and Baal, the prophets of Baal, were on a mountaintop. And there was going to be this massive showdown. Whose God would answer their prayers? Well, the prophets of Baal raised up an altar, put on a sacrifice to that altar, and Elijah did the same for Yahweh. And the, he, he graciously let the prophets of Baal go first. And they called on Baal all day long. They screamed and they shouted. And Elijah at one point says to him, maybe he's asleep or maybe he's off in the bathroom. That's literally what the text says. So call louder. And they scream and they shout and they dance. They even go so far as to cut themselves. And so their blood is also flowing and nothing happens. And so Elijah steps up for his turn. He takes his sacrifice and his altar. And then he proceeds to have all the people around him to drench it in water. This was to be a fire sacrifice, a burning sacrifice, and he drenches it in water so that it is soaked all the way through. Nothing could start that on fire, not even a strike of lightning. And then Elijah simply says, God, burn this sacrifice. And fire rains down from heaven, consumes the sacrifice, consumes the sacrifice of Baal as well. And Elijah tells the prophets, the school of the prophets around him, kill them. And so they are all killed with the sword. Well, Jezebel's not happy about this and sends out her army to take Elijah. And Elijah runs. He runs for his life because he has now been canceled by the culture. And he literally runs until he can run no more. He drops under a broom tree and he can't go anymore. Until God provides food and drink. And in the strength of that food, he is revived and able to travel on. Now, Elijah ends up at Mount Horeb. Horeb is just another name for Mount Sinai. And this would be the first time that a follower of God, Yahweh, would be back at Sinai since Moses came down from Sinai with the Ten Commandments. 
Moses saw God on Mount Sinai in the burning bush. Elijah sees a whirlwind, sees an earthquake, sees fire, and yet God is not in any of those except in a still small voice and says, I have called you to be a prophet. Now go and speak my word to them. And so Elijah is never again to be afraid. He is not afraid of being canceled by the culture. He strengthens the school of prophets around him. There's, there's a group of prophets, thousands of them, that will speak God's word. And he anoints his successor, Elisha, and at the end of his story, which is in 2 Kings, right at the beginning, Elijah is taken up in the fiery chariots and horsemen of Israel in a whirlwind, bodily taken into heaven without dying. And so this story, this Sunday school story, which also happens to be true, is a lot like your story. You may not be able to call down fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice. You may not enter into heaven bodily in fiery chariots and horsemen, but you have been called by God when you were baptized. When God called you by name and poured water on your head, he called you out of the world and called you in order to be trained to go back into the world. He calls you out of the world for special forces training. That starts in Sunday school and then continues on with catechism or confirmation classes and then advanced training in youth and adult Bible study. And then you are sent back out into the world, into the war zone of this world, to a culture that is as antagonistic to Christianity as it has rarely been before. Certainly, the culture has always been antagonistic to the message of Jesus, starting with the Romans in the first three centuries. And throughout history, there have been persecutions. And in the last century, you had the National Socialists and the Communistic States, Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, all antagonistic of the Christian faith. And in today, here in America, we see the remnants of that still with Marxism and socialism making its way back into our culture. It's very antagonistic, very counter to the Christian faith. And so we face that again. And that's why God, who called us by name in baptism, is now training us through the special forces training that we call Bible study and worship. And so we are sent out to fight against this culture, but not the way you may be thinking. We do not fight against flesh and blood. We don't use the weapons of war, guns and swords or anything like that. And we don't fight against people themselves. Paul makes this clear in Ephesians chapter 6. He says, we do not fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this world, the flesh and blood, but instead against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We see a physical world around us, but there is a war on the spiritual plane, the spiritual level, that we can't really see with our eyes, but we see the results of it all the time in a culture that tries to cancel Christianity, even against our own sinful human nature. We think about those lies that we tell ourselves that we're not worthy, that we are not strong enough to carry the name Christian in our own lives. Satan comes along then as we're remembering our sins and our unworthiness, and he throws our sins right back in our faces. He reminds us of our failures, of which there are many, if you're honest with yourself. There are many in my own life as well. But what we need to be reminded of is not our failures, but instead of Jesus' success on our part. And there are ways to remind ourselves of that. You know the song Bridge Over Troubled Water, made popular by Simon and Garfunkel and then covered by various artists throughout the times, the last decades or so. That's Jesus for us. He is our bridge over the troubled water of our culture and our lives. Jesus is always the friend that we will always have. He never will forsake us. He will always be with us. And Jesus gives us the food that will always, always strengthen us. He talks about this in the beginning 
of the gospel reading that we heard this weekend. John 6, he calls himself the bread of life. In the next chapter, Jesus will talk about the living water that he brings. And so Jesus is this for us. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. And in the strength of that food and drink, we can carry on our calling. Jesus is also as close to us as your own Bibles or your Bible app or a podcast that talks about the Word of God. Jesus is as close to you as your Bible study in church or your worship service. And he is that food for us that I think you need to remember is too good to keep to yourselves, which is why we admonish you as pastors and encourage you to invite others to come and hear this good news, to feast upon Jesus and drink the living water that we have here at St. Matthew or whatever church that you attend and participate in on our members of. There is strength in this food because we are promised by God that through Jesus, this food will forgive our sins. This food will Give us life anew. This food will give us the promise of eternal life, salvation itself. And this is seen in the Lord's Supper, which is a food that is heavenly, that is Jesus himself. And so here's what I want you to do. Every meal from here on out, I want it to remind you of the strength in that food which God gives you. Every time you eat something, be reminded that God gives you a food of strength in Jesus Christ. So let me wrap all this up with a story about a soldier's first Thanksgiving after the war. He came home from the battle zone after years out in war, and it came time for that first Thanksgiving. Now, as he sat down at his parents' table, it was the same Thanksgiving dinner that he remembered before he went off to war. It's the same food, turkey, mashed potatoes, cranberry sauce, pumpkin pie. But somehow this now was different because of all those years of eating MREs or less in the ungodly conditions of the battle zone, the war zone. And so that first Thanksgiving after coming home from war was so good, he promised himself that he would share it with as many people as possible for the rest of his life. And so he shared it with his friends. He got married. He shared it with his wife and his family and his extended family. Up to the point where the first Thanksgiving after he died, many decades later, that was a celebration no less exuberant than all the others before them because he had reminded them that it was more than just a meal. It was a way to remember how much God loves us, provides for us, takes care of us in his son, Jesus Christ. And so when you go out today, maybe you're going to go out to dinner tonight, you'll certainly, most likely, if you're hearing my voice, going to be with us Sunday afternoon for our annual pig roast. Let's celebrate all these meals as they remind us, as they are now a foretaste of the feast to come and the wedding banquet that never ends, that Jesus Christ is even now preparing for us in heaven. Let them, those meals, be a reminder of the food that will always strengthen. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.